this all begins to come home, I think, when you specify it in terms of particular situations. Let's take three. Germany. On present demographic trends, Germany, which is by most measures the healthiest of European economies right now, will nonetheless, between now and 2050, which is not that far away, maybe the Orioles will be over 500. <laughs> Germany, between now and 2050, will lose the equivalent in population of the entire old East Germany. Spain, in that same period, will lose one quarter of its native Spanish population. And perhaps most astonishingly of all, Italy, which I think in most Americans' imaginations is still uh, a culture of large extended families with two, three, maybe even four generations around the table at lunch on a Sunday afternoon, great feast days. Italy, by 2050, 60% of Italians will not know from personal experience, what a brother, a sister, an aunt, an uncle, or a cousin is. Those will be simply abstract concepts to 60% of Italians. And when you think about it, this begins to come into focus. When the only child marries another only child, and they have one child who marries another only child, etc., 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 and you do that over three or four generations, then you don't have cousins. You don't have aunts and uncles, much less brothers and sisters. So, then the question became, why was a continent that at this moment in time was healthier, wealthier, more secure than ever before, why was it failing to create the human future in the most elemental sense of creating the human future? Creating next generations. That question, in turn, seemed to me to be susceptible only to an answer in the order of moral culture. You couldn't look to politics or economics for a satisfactory answer to this. The politics were stable. The economics, at least in those days, this is seven or eight years ago, were good. Politics are, the politics are unstable and the economics are not good now because the effects of this self-depopulation are beginning to kick in. But in any event, seven or eight years ago, so what, what was going on here? It seemed to me something had to be going on in people's hearts and minds. Something had to be going on in, in people's souls. If you will. And that is when I began to reread a great work by one of Father Rock's Jesuit colleagues, the mid-20th century French theologian Henri de Lubin, who in the midst of the Second World War wrote a book called The Drama of Atheist Humanism. The Drama of Atheistic Humanism. And Father de Lubin's question was, why had Europe, which had begun the 20th century, with such high expectations, was the center of world culture, economy, and political initiative. Why had this continent, within 40 years, produced two world wars, cheeseburger coming, two world wars, three totalitarian systems, the Holocaust of European Jewry, the Ukrainian terror film, 
the Gulag, and all of the rest of it. What on earth was going on? And the blue box suggested that the answer to what had been going wrong in Europe in the first half of the 20th century actually took you back to the high culture of the 19th century in Europe, where this notion of atheistic humanism, a humanism in which the God of the Bible was deliberately jettisoned, thrown over the side, uh, as an obstacle to human maturation and human liberation. That willful abandonment of the God of the Bible, the Lubach suggested, set in motion a process of cultural decay, there's only one word for it, that involved such enormous intellectual figures as August Comte, Ludwig Feuerbach, Karl Marx, Friedrich Nietzsche, and which essentially stripped out of Europe the biblical roots of its common life. This seemed to me to begin to get you to something of an answer as to why Europe was systematically depopulated. If you throw the God of the Bible over the side, it seems, you throw his first commandment over the side too. And the first commandment of the God of the Bible is not, I am the Lord your God, you shall not have other gods before me. The first commandment of the God of the Bible is be fruitful and multiply. This great forgetting <clears throat> of the truth of biblical religion seemed to me to begin to get us to something uh, of an answer. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, the circumstances today in our mother cultures of Europe uh, has not improved over the past seven or eight years. In fact, it has gotten worse. For the secularism that has dominated European high culture for decades now is not a benign and kind secularism. It's a hegemonic secularism, which wants to occupy all of the available public space and wants to reduce religious conviction to a kind of private recreational activity of no public consequence. Now, if all of this is beginning to sound vaguely familiar, it's because this set of problems has migrated across the Atlantic uh, and has been working its way into the high culture of our own country uh, for several decades now uh, and I think is coming to a particular high point of drama uh, in this election cycle in a way which no one uh, predicted. Uh, but it is, it is very clear to some of us, at least, uh, that the present administration in the United States is committed to a secular public space in which religious institutions and their functions will be tolerated so long as they do what the state, in this case the federal government, tells them. In other words, so long as they become agents of federal governmental power. And that is, of course, what the whole argument over the past six weeks, two months, about the so-called HHS or mandate is about. This is an argument about birth control about as much as the American Revolution was an argument about tea. Uh, this is an argument about religious freedom. It's an argument about the integrity of the institutions of civil society. It's an argument about whether the state enforcing a kind of hegemonic secularism is going to occupy just about all the available space.
space in, uh, in uh, society. One further set of thoughts on this, and then I will happily turn this over to secure. The civilization of the Western world, uh, in, which is unique, it's unique in its way of organizing public life, uh, it's unique in its civility and tolerance, uh, it's unique in its intellectual fertility, uh, its intellectual fecundity. That civilization seems to me to have been built on three foundations. It's like a stool with three legs. One of those legs is marked Jerusalem, another one is marked Athens, and the third is marked Rome. In other words, the three foundational cultural realities of Western civilization are biblical religion, which taught the West that life is not just one damn thing after another, but it's a journey, it's a pilgrimage. It's coming from somewhere and it's going somewhere. Therefore, it is purpose. Athens, Greek rationality, which taught the West that there are truths embedded in the world and in us, and we can get at those truths perhaps only partially, but we can get at them through the exercise of the arts of reason, and Roman jurisprudence, which taught the West that the rule of law is superior to the rule of brute force. You need all three, it seems, to sustain this unique civilization. Because what has happened when one of the legs of the stool got kicked out, namely the leg marked Jerusalem, biblical religion, in what Father de Lubach called the drama of atheist humans. Well, it turns out that the, the Athens leg started to get very wobbly. Faith in reason began to erode some generations after faith in the God of the Bible, who imprints his reason on the world, so that the world is in fact world, began to disappear. So we get things like postmodernist philosophy and literary criticism, in which there is no longer anything called the truth. There may be your truth and my truth, but there's nothing called the truth. This is, this is a very wobbly Athenian leg, if you will, on the stool of Western civilization. And if two legs go out of a three-leg stool, that third leg is going to get very wobbly, as indeed has happened. This is what the present Pope Benedict XVI means by the dictatorship of relativism. The replacement of the rule of law, law understood as a rational reflection on public goods and the distillation of that into constitutional and civil law, law simply becomes coercion. Law simply becomes state coercion. And what is being imposed by state coercion is, of course, a relativistic understanding uh, of the human condition. This is precisely what the Maryland State Legislature uh, did uh, a couple of weeks ago in uh, passing the so-called gay uh, marriage. That was a perfect example of the dictatorship of relatives, the attempt to redefine the fundamental human reality by coercive state power. 